Hey, this is Amy with Behind the Tweet. So today I'd like to talk a little bit about neuroinflammation and what I begin to think about when I hear studies um, that find neuroinflammation in patients with different conditions. So I think there's been an increase lately in studies that um, have focused on neuroinflammation. I've been looking at a lot of Alzheimer's research, certainly other conditions like Parkinson's, and even in the condition ME-CFS, there's more indication that there may be a significant amount of inflammation in the brain. Um, and you can assess that inflammation in a couple different ways, brain scans, um, looking at different brain regions, and sometimes just by studying the immune system itself. And one of the common things that people find is that the immune system, and this is pretty much the definition of your neuroinflammation, the immune response in the brain is activated in some way that you would not see in a healthy person. It's stimulated. Immune cells are activated or they're acting differently than they would in healthy controls. Now, I think there's a tendency based on those findings to assume that the immune system itself may be off in patients with these conditions. And that is indeed a possibility, right? So it could be that in these conditions, something is wrong in the brain that's causing the immune system to misfire or almost overreact or in a, in a sense, just cause inflammation because it's not functioning correctly. However, whenever I see the term inflammation, whether it's in the brain, neuroinflammation, or other parts of the body, I always begin to wonder if infection or the microbiome could be involved. And that's because inflammation is generated in response to infectious agents. So let's say you get the flu. The symptoms that you get when you get the flu are really not due very much to the fact that the virus isn't, I mean, some of the symptoms are, but the virus, for example, is not eating your cells. It's not doing anything too crazy, what you mostly feel as symptoms is your immune system responding to the virus. So the immune system releases inflammatory molecules, cytokines, chemokines, in response to the virus to try to kill it. And then you'll also see that if it successfully kills the virus, the cell that the virus sometimes inhabited dies. There's a process called apoptosis or cell death. Then the immune system has to clear up the debris from the dying infected cell. There's also release of bacterial endotoxins. Sometimes if it's a bacterial infection, you'll see some more toxins in the blood. So basically the symptoms you get are an inflammatory response due to the fact that your immune system is trying to target a pathogen, an infectious agent. So the same thing might be happening when we find neuroinflammation. And so when I hear about neuroinflammation, I'm always interested in, in saying, okay, cool. Once this is established, can we look upstream and also consider the fact that what might be driving at least parts of the neuroinflammation is persistent infection or imbalance or dysbiosis of the human microbiome? And you might say, Amy, the microbiome is not in the brain. Well, there's early evidence that microbes can indeed persist in the brain. So especially if you follow Alzheimer's research these days, you'll see that there have been fungal populations identified in the brain. There's been viruses that have now shown to be able to persist in the brain. A couple studies that show bacterial communities seem to persist in the brain. And so these are early results, but certainly very, very interesting ones. And in fact, there's a team at Harvard that I actually just spoke with last week and met in person who are doing what's called the Brain Microbiome Project. So they're actually trying to better understand if there is a brain microbiome, pretty much like the gut microbiome, an ecosystem of microbes in the brain also. So let's, and, and their data is pretty interesting. It seems they're leaning towards the fact that there, there is one, right? Okay. So with that in mind, if you see a study that finds neuroinflammation, you would say, okay, could there be microbes that might be affecting this? And by the way, the microbes don't even have to be in the brain. They might be in the gut, but they might be signaling through what's called the gut-brain axis. They may be signaling in a way that could affect the brain and cause the immune system in the brain to act differently or activate, right? Or microbes could be in the blood and also probably communicate with brain pathways. There's certainly a lot of connection between pathways in the body and signaling pathways. So one thing I've seen lately is that uh, I've seen a focus on microglia and astrocytes, which are two types of brain cells that often to be, seem to be activated or at least maybe activated or functioning differently in patients with neuroinflammation or a neuro condition. And um, whenever I see those cells, that really actually 
um, points out to me that we should probably look at persistent infection as a possible driver of that activation. Because for example, um, I'm just reading, I, I just Googled one of the first papers I found on this because there's so much research on this actually. Uh, microglia are key players of the immune response in the central nervous system and being the resident innate immune cells, they are responsible for the early control of infections and for the recruitment of cells of the adaptive immune system required for pathogen clearance. So microglia definitely play a role in the immune system's response to persistent infectious agents. Okay, so we have that. We have um, a, a straight up possible response to infectious agents that we definitely need to keep in mind when we see cells like microglia or astrocytes being activated. But I also wanna point out a second study that I think is really important to understand in the same context of this question. And this is a study called microglial control of astrocytes in response to microbial metabolites. And what this study showed, and I'll post a link to this study in the um, box under this video. What this study found is that astrocytes and microglia communicate with each other in the central nervous system. But tryptophan, which is a metabolite that's often or can be created by bacteria in the gut. So in this case, they looked at gut microbes, commensal gut microbes, actually. Microbes that didn't even seem to be driving any kind of illness in the gut. And they found that tryptophan created by these gut microbes actually controlled signaling between microglia and astrocytes, even outside the gut. So what they, what they basically reported, which was, was that, quote, the end, these findings define a pathway through which microbial metabolites limit pathogenic activities of microglia and astrocytes and influence CNS inflammation. And basically it's a little complicated the way they do this. The uh, tryptophan metabolites created by the microbes actually affect the way the cells communicate through a specific receptor called the R. Our, our hydrocarbon receptor, um, which is a receptor that I actually have to study up a little bit more. The general point I want to take away from this is that it's not just microbes that can cause um, microglia and astrocytes to function differently. It's the metabolites and proteins expressed by these organisms. They can even play an essential role in the signaling of these cell types. So my basic final message is that whenever we see a finding that finds that the immune system is acting differently than we would expect. We should always do some follow-up studies and try to see if the signaling between those cells may be affected by the microbiome, pathogens, the metabolites or proteins created by those pathogens, or any type of persistent infection or um, basically persistent microbes that are in the human body. So that would be my take on a couple studies that are coming out recently on neuroinflammation, which is let's characterize that neuroinflammation. Let's definitely understand the immune response, but to not factor in the fact that microbes might be involved would be unfortunate. And let me just finally conclude with a little bit of an analogy. The way I see, if you just look at the immune system in a, in a condition, it's a little like looking at the forest, let's say a forest, and just looking at the trees and not really looking at the animals. So the immune system is so connected to microbes in the microbiome that, that one, um, the microbiome ex, uh, affects how the immune system acts and the immune system will affect how the microbiome acts. So it could be equivalent if you looked at a forest and you said, and you didn't take the animals into consideration, which would be kind of like the microbiome or persistent infectious agents. You would say, wow, like those trees, they're acting so interestingly. Sometimes the trees grow over there more than the other trees and Sometimes those trees are being cut down. We don't really get it. You're just looking at the trees and you're seeing their strange activity in the way they're growing and acting. Now you need to make sure that you study if there are any animals in that forest because what you might find out is there are animals that are actually eating a lot of the trees. And that's why some of the trees, there's less populations of trees. Or maybe some animals are living in trees and they're causing more trees, that type of tree to grow, right? So what I think is important to keep in mind is that whenever we do a study of the immune response, we also consider how the microbiome may be affecting that immune response. That's my message for today. Take care. See you soon.